Good evening and welcome to the September Tri-County Sustainability General Meeting. Hello, everyone. We are the hub of, for the 101 towns and 10 legislative districts and 1.2 million residents of Burlington, Camden, and Gloucester counties. My name is Bill Johnson from the beautiful borough of Collingswood. I chair the TCS Environmental Justice Committee with the help of my co-chairs, Renee and Sharonda. Like many of the TCS committees, we are back to our fall schedule. Our EJ committee meetings are typically monthly on the third Friday at 4 p.m. via Zoom. All are welcome, meeting details to follow. Okay, before we get started, a few quick reminders. First, please everyone put your name, town, and county in the chat. Second, don't forget that we have two important in-person events coming up. This September, the Saturday, September 30th, is our EV showcase at the Deptford Mall. Stop by, kick the tires, and ask questions. Ask plenty of questions. Second, the 2023 All Green Teams Conference will, on Wednesday, October 18th, meet at the beautiful Cherry Hill Library. We want to see everyone there. We have a great program tonight, great guests, and important topics. We ask that all of our speakers and moderators watch the clock, and there will be time for Q&A after our final guest speaker. Now let's bring in my buddy, Vicki Benetti from Washington Township, Gloucester County, to introduce tonight's first guest. Hello, Vicki. Hey, Bill. Um, well, let's get started. Those of you who are with us in July, uh, you'll remember that our New Jersey State climatologist, Dr. Dave Robinson, provided an excellent overview of how climate change has been affecting our physical environment, particularly looking at factors such as temperature, precipitation, and sea level rise, and changes we might anticipate in the future. As part of our continuing series on the impacts of climate change on New Jersey, this month, we're going to hear from Dr. James Shoke about how sea level rise and extreme heat are impacting people's health. And that happens around the world as well as here in New Jersey. Dr. Shope is a climatologist from the Agricultural Experiment Station and the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers. And for almost 10 years, he's been conducting research on coastal risk reduction using applied cl climatology, hydrodynamic modeling, statistical data analysis and geospatial analysis, among other tools, all to understand how agricultural production, municipal planning, and public health will respond to warming climate, heavier rainfall, and more frequent flooding. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to James. James, are you there? Yeah. Thank you very much, Vicki. Go ahead. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Get that going somewhere in here. Oh, geez, it's giving a little bit of difficulty. You know how it is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll just share this and then bring this up. It'll be fine. Okay, and then there we go. Well, awesome. Uh, like Vicky said, today I'll be talking about climate change and health. Um, Broadly the world over, but really focused in on New Jersey specifics. Um, as you mentioned, I'm part of the uh, Agricultural Experiment Station here at Rutgers in the Department of Environmental Sciences. And what I want to start with is this uh, phrase here. Climate change is a public health emergency. So often when we think about climate change, we think about the physical effects, the rising sea levels, the storms, the heat but we don't think as much about those downstream effects. Climate change can exacerbate health conditions. It can make, uh, it can increase the number of people visiting emergency departments and the like. So climate change is very, in a very real sense, a health emergency. You can use the same logic to also say, you know, it's a forestry emergency. It's an agricultural emergency. It touches a number of different fields. And I want to briefly give just the smallest overview of just what's driving climate change. So climate change is primarily driven by the combustion of fossil fuels, um, at least anthropogenic climate change, human caused. Um, so we burn coal, petroleum, natural gas, and that emits greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, um, like carbon dioxide. 
And those, ba those cause our atmosphere to warm over time. So if we look at, for example, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we have good measurements here in parts per million from 19, the late 1950s to basically today. Um, the red line represents monthly measurements. The black line is just an average through that, so we can kind of see what's going on. And our proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been increasing. Um, the concentration above 415 parts per million, where typically we have exceeded 420 earlier in the year. So we're increasingly adding more and more carbon dioxide. And that results directly in warming. So pictured here is a graphic from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showing surface temperatures around the globe relative to pre-industrial conditions. So it's in degrees Celsius, so I apologize for, uh, for that, but uh, this is like an international graphic, so that's how that works. The black line represents our average, um, our observed average temperatures for the entire world um, up to 2015. After that, we have scenarios of how warming may change in the future based on our emissions. Lower emissions puts us on this blue pathway with a lower amount of warming. Higher greenhouse gas emissions put us on this red pathway. And based on our current policy and kind of an optimistic outlook, we're following this gold pathway currently. So that puts us at about 2.7 degrees of warming relative to this pre-industrial period by the end of the century. And that warming drives a number of negative um, natural hazard effects. Um, it can intensify storms, making them more destructive along our coastlines. It can change rainfall patterns, making, making um, heavier rainfall in some locations, causing flooding or drought conditions in others, or even um, dry conditions that are conducive for wildfires that bring with them um, you know, smoke that's very bad for people with asthma and the like. So when we think about climate change, we have kind of these bigger effects like increasing sea levels or rising temperatures. And I pulled this graphic from the CDC. I really like it. But then we had this kind of next level, so what? So rising temperature leads to extreme heat waves or ca causes severe weather, or maybe we see worsened air pollution. Um, a big one is changes in vector ecology, basically the range of mosquitoes and ticks and other um, pests that carry uh, dangerous diseases with them. And those have a further downstream effect in terms of our health at, for our communities and for our individual, our own health. So extreme heat, for example, we expect to see with climate change and rising temperatures, more heat related illnesses and death, or worsened air pollution that exacerbates pre-existing conditions like asthma. And as I mentioned, changes in vector ecology can um, cause certain diseases to expand their ranges like uh, malaria or, um, you know, last year we had several cases of West Nile virus in New Jersey. And of course, there's other impacts like water quality and food supply. And I'm not going to run through all of this, but just to give you a sense that there's a very real connection between these climate change effects, their impacts, and then the kind of um, trickle down health consequences. So I wanna talk a little bit about just some specifics for New Jersey. Um, it, when we think about temperatures in New Jersey, we know it gets kind of warm here in the summer anyway, but if we have high greenhouse gas emissions, it's projected that by the end of the century, about 70% of our summers are gonna be warmer than any before 2006. And by the end of the century, about 90% will be. Now, if we tamp down on our greenhouse gas emissions globally, those percentages go down, but what we're gonna see is a number of superlatively hot summers throughout New Jersey moving forward. And the consequence of this is um, increased um, heat related illnesses, hospital emissions and deaths, especially amongst the most vulnerable populations. Part of that's due to the heat, part of it's also due to increased humidity. Um, in a place like New Jersey, the warmer it gets, typically the more humid it can get. And the more humid it is, um, the harder it is for our bodies to cool off. Um, we cool off by perspiring, we sweat. And what cools us off is that sweat evaporating off our skin. Now, if we have increased humidity, that evaporation process doesn't work as well. And so we have higher heat stress risk at the individual level. 
Additionally, extreme heat can overburden our building cooling systems. So if you're already suffering from, um, you know, uh, heat exhaustion or the like, and you try to go inside to cool off, those are not as effective on hot days. And this extreme heat is amplified in our urban sectors um, here, in, well, everywhere, but it's a special importance here in New Jersey. We call this the urban heat island effect. And what it is, is we have um, materials and surfaces like pavement, concrete, the roofs of buildings, they absorb solar radiation and re-radiate it back out as heat. They don't reflect solar radiation, they heat up and then we feel that heat. When you have a high density of those, like in an urban environment, it can cause that local area to be several degrees warmer than surrounded forested or um, rural environments. Um, also of importance here in New Jersey is the fact that we have a lot of suburban areas which also suffer from the uh, the heat island effect, although to a lesser extent than say Camden or Trenton. And we've seen this effect in terms of increasing temperatures causing more hospitalizations here in New Jersey. So here we have the number of incidences on the left for heat related hospitalizations and on the right heat related emergency department visits in red and blue respectively. And you can see that uh, this is between 2004 and 2013. And you can see that these have generally been going up, not dramatically, but noticeably. And we expect to see that continue into the future. So we know that our heat is going to increase and that's gonna cause um, negative health outcomes for, related to extreme heat. But I also want us to focus in on the negative health outcomes associated with sea level rise. So, Sea levels are rising in New Jersey. They've risen about 18 inches since the early 1900s off of our coast. And we expect that to continue as well. So pictured here is sea level rise relative to the year 2000 from a Rutgers uh, report. Now this report is actually used by the State Department of Environmental Protection for flood regulations and the like. And the simple way to parse this is this um, yellow cream colored area is the what's called the likely range of change, basically where we think it could be by a certain year. So by 2100, we expect our sea levels to be somewhere between two and five feet higher. And then the red line represents our median estimate, our best guess, and that's gonna be about 3.3 feet higher. So we know sea levels are gonna rise, they're gonna continue rising, and that can cause a number of problems. Now, the first thing everyone thinks of when they think of sea level rise is the encroaching tide kind of eating away at land maybe um, you know, encroaching onto someone's property. But where it's much more dramatic and where we're gonna see that effect sooner is with uh, storm surge flooding. So I really like this graphic. Here we have a house on land and during existing high tide, it's protected, it's built to code, it's fine. Say we have a storm coming through like a hurricane or a nor'easter, that creates storm surge. And storm surge is just the vertical elevation of the water due to storm effects, winds, pressures, and the like. But since the house is built to current standards, it's protected. And you notice that storm surge just stacks right on top of, of high tide. With sea level rise, we take that high tide baseline and we shift it higher, meaning that our storm surge now stacks on top of that and can flood inland further and um, flood certain areas more deeply, causing more damage. So, I would say we're going to see this more, we're going to see this in the future, but we've actually already seen it on our coast here in New Jersey. So pictured here on the right is the Hurricane Sandy storm surge extent uh, throughout the state of New Jersey. And a study from 2021 estimated that about 13% of the property damage from Hurricane Sandy can be attributed to human cost sea level rise. Basically, because sea levels were higher due to human interference to, with the climate system, um, it caused about $4 billion more billion worth of property damage than it would have otherwise. So that's just property. Think about the lives that are impacted, the health consequences and the like, and I'll get to that in a second. And for extreme coastal flooding, we expect it to occur about five times as frequently by 2050, simply because of sea level rise. You don't really need a big of, as big of a storm to generate a large amount of flooding when you have that higher sea level baseline. So 
if we think about the effects of what these kind of storms may look like in the future, we can actually harken back to Hurricane Sandy and think about some of the health endpoints from it. So following Sandy, some we had the highest frequency of calls to poison control centers right after Sandy because food, water, and everything was contaminated. Um, we don't think about the psychological and emotional effects of uh, climate change and natural hazards, but children living in homes damaged during Sandy were particularly high risk for psychological and emotional issues. Uh, in a very broad scale perspective, Sandy itself caused directly 34 deaths throughout the state. 19% uh, of residents in shore um, of the New Jersey shore post Sandy reported mold growing in their homes. Um, which can be very bad for asthma, COPD, other respiratory illnesses. We saw an increase in hospitalizations for diabetes complications. What people don't think about is after a big storm or any sort of natural disaster, um, services are interrupted. And that doesn't just mean your power goes out. It means you may not be able to access your healthcare facilities. You need to go see the doctor because you you're having um, an issue with diabetes or maybe you need to go to a dialysis clinic and you could be cut off by floodwaters for days at a time. So there's these kind of consequences that we need to think about when we think about the health impacts. And then we saw an increase in emergency department visits and hospitalizations for COPD and asthma for older adults post Sandy as well. And that was only one part of the story, the coastal flooding part of the story. We also want to think about how our rainfall is going to change in the future. So these are projections for just lower greenhouse gas emissions, higher greenhouse gas emissions, showing the change in really intense rainfall throughout the throughout the United States. And if we zoom in on New Jersey, the one on the left here is more likely to happen. Um, rainfall throughout the state during our extreme events is likely about 20 to 30 percent greater or I should say the fraction of rainfall we get from our extreme events is gonna be about 20 to 30% greater. So we're expecting to see more intense and more frequent large rainfall events. And that pairs with how we think future tropical cyclones are going to change. So one, we expect to see more intense rainfall. Two, we expect to see more intense tropical cyclones because our oceans are warmer. So warm water is fuel for a hurricane. So we expect them to be more energetic. So basically we expect to see more categories three and fours as opposed to twos and threes. Um, we expect to see them intensify more rapidly. So pictured here is Hurricane Ida from 2021 before it made landfall in Louisiana. It encountered a tongue of warm water and jumped up in intensity very rapidly. And the emergency response for, say, a category two versus a category four, very different things. And they will bring almost certainly more rainfall for each storm. So when we think back to Ida and its impacts here in New Jersey, it may be a harbinger of what our rainfall may look like in the future. It underscores how susceptible we are to flooding and those consequences. Ida had intense flash flooding that killed 30 people here in New Jersey. So if we're thinking about those health endpoints, that's one. The other is, again, people being cut off from the services they need to maintain a healthy living style. So I want to now just transition to thinking, how does climate change affect our communities? So we have that kind of holistic view of climate change, but if we want to think about how it affects the health of all Americans and the people in our communities, it's helpful to think of it as almost this cycle. If you have a hazard coming from climate change, say a heat wave, um, before we receive that it's impact, it's filtered through a few different um, aspects of our community. Maybe it's our climate and environmental conditions. If you live in an urban area, a heat wave tends to hit you harder than if you don't. Our population and demographic characteristics. Um, for example, for thinking of the heat wave, children as a, as a demographic group, tend to be harder hit by heat waves. And then socioeconomic factors. Simply put, people who don't have a lot of money can't respond as effectively to extreme heat. So any sort of hazards filtered through these broad bins before we see that societal impact, and then we can start thinking about our hazard mitigation and adaptation for that. 
So we really want to think about what contributes to these characteristics here on the right. And this is a graphic I've stolen from the EPA that kind of shows how different groups of people respond to different uh, or have different health outcomes from various climate hazards. So I mentioned children are a high, higher risk of heat stroke and they can have um, more heat exhaustion and the like. Low income communities may not be able to um, rebuild after a, a flooding event, for example, and they're a higher risk of uh, physical and mental illnesses following flooding and being in crowded shelter conditions. Um, of a particular interest or interest, a particular note are our communities of color. Um, historically, our communities of color have been um, underinvested in. And what we see is our communities of colors tend to be in more risk prone areas. Maybe they live more uh, in flood zones or what you'll see in New Jersey are um, communities of color right next to um, air pollution areas, which can worsen asthma. If you have a heat wave that intensifies, um, or I should say worsens air quality, which can further exacerbate that asthma. So we wanna consider all of these kind of ranges of how people respond to climate change and those health outcomes. And what it kind of comes down to is that climate change kind of exacerbates the root cause of health inequities. So climate change itself doesn't tend to cause a lot of the health problems. What it tends to do is exacerbate them. You may have heard that the US military cause, uh, calls climate change a threat multiplier. Well, it's a health impact multiplier as well. So we already have these disparities in terms of health, in terms of income within our communities that may make certain groups um, more vulnerable to climate change, more vulnerable to certain health outcomes, a higher prevalence of, for example, um, asthma or heart disease. And climate change isn't gonna cause more of that, but it is gonna cause more problems associated with it. It's gonna cause people to have to visit the emergency department more because it aggravates cardiovascular disease, for example. So climate change and health inequities are inextricably linked. And so it disproportionately affects um, the health of low-income communities and communities of color. And we do see that throughout New Jersey. And we can address these by looking at the root cause that they both share if we want to improve our community health in the light of climate change. So I don't wanna leave off with some doom and gloom. I just wanna say some of the things that we can do. If we adapt to climate change, basically think about the things that's gonna to happen to us in the future and take steps to avoid those worst impacts, it reduces the risks to our property as well as our person and can it help improve our community health. A simple one is, if we're worried about the urban heat island causing heat exhaustion in the future, planting some urban trees can help alleviate that. If we're worried about the flooding effects, maintaining our coastal wetlands can help reduce flooding in the future. And then that also has that downhill or that downstream effect of making sure people are not incurring those negative health outcomes that are associated with those hazards. And we can also reduce our emissions. So, you know, this is a plug for green energy, but if we uh, transition to renewable energies and get away from um, putting as much greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the amount of climate change that we're gonna see in the future is gonna be lessened. And obviously if climate change is not as severe, then there it results in greater health benefits overall for, this, for the, the world really and, and for New Jersey as well. So with that, I want to just give you a few resources here for, for interest. Um, we have uh, the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance, Climate Change Resource Center and Climate Institute at Rutgers. I encourage you to check those out and their resources. And then the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center has an NJ Adapt tool set that lets you visualize climate change hazards in your own communities, as well as we're developing a public health and climate change tool that we're hoping to release later this year or next that um, you'll be able to visualize how climate, may, climate change may impact the actual, directly the health of your community. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much.
James, that was great. Thank you. Very informative. And thank you for all those resources. Um, just and, as a uh, reminder to everyone, there will uh, be um, the, the a recording of this meeting will be available on YouTube and you can get them that way. And the resources will, will also appear in the chat. I'm sorry, James, you were about to say something. Oh, I was going to say, but I'm also happy to share the slides uh, after the fact so you can have those resources. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are holding questions until the end of our presentations this evening, and I'm sure we're going to have a flood of questions. Speaking of flooding, South Jersey got a lot of rain these last few days, and, uh, you know, we're kind of getting used to all those severe weather alerts uh, for flooding, extreme heat, tornadoes, even snowstorms. Uh, I believe there's a coastal flooding alert for tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Did you know the folks keeping our region weather aware are lo located right here in our footprint? It's my pleasure to now welcome Sarah Johnson, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist. <laughs> I easy for you to say, Sarah, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist for the National Weather Service in Mount Holly. Hey, Sarah. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, let me share my screen. All right, and just a sec here. All right, thank you all so much again for having me. Um, and um, as with the previous presentation, I have some resources too that will be available at the last um, the last slide, but I've also put it in chat just so you're not having to furiously try to jot down some of the uh, URLs and resources that I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, but yes, um, thank you thank you for that introduction. Um, as mentioned, I'm, my name is Sarah Johnson. I'm with um, your local National Weather Service office. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the National Weather Service and what are some of the resources that we have. Um, a little caveat, um, when I was asked this, I when I was asked to, to present to you all, I did um, watch uh, Dr. Robinson's presentation that he gave a few months ago. Um, and I thought he did a really good job of explaining the difference between climate and weather. And so a lot of what I do in my job is focused on weather, um, uh, focused on the next seven days, which when we're talking about climate and climate impacts, um, that we're generally talking about on a larger scale over a larger time scale as well. Um, but um, there's obviously a lot of overlap uh, between uh, the, the two areas. Um, so, and there's even overlap within the National Weather Service. Um, our office is a local office. We're focused more on the a local area and in a shorter time scale. But we have a national center called the Climate Prediction Center that focuses more on the seasonal variability um, and more on, um, you know, the longer range, the climate, getting into the climate range. Uh, so the National Weather Service, we are a part of the federal government. Um, we're under the Department of Commerce um, under NOAA. NOAA is an umbrella organization that the National Weather Service is underneath. Um, we are um, part of the whole enterprise. There's obviously a lot of uh, private companies that do weather forecasting, um, and not to mention broadcast media, uh, but we are the only official source for weather watches, warnings, and advisories. So 99 times out of 100 that you're getting a warning, be it a tornado warning or getting a watch, like a winter storm watch, that's probably coming from the National Weather Service um, uh, because of the um, uh, public safety factor. Uh, like I said, we're we're the only source for official net, uh, watches and warnings. Um, as mentioned, uh, the local office, and I'll get to exactly how many offices there are across the country, but our local office, the one that I work at, is right here. Uh, it's actually in Burlington County. Um, we're officially known as the Philadelphia Mount Holly office because back in the early 1990s, we were in Philadelphia and then moved to our current building, which is technically our mailing address is Mount Holly, but we are physically in West Hampton, as you know, uh, often is the case around uh, this part of New Jersey. Um, but this is a look at our operations floor. Um, we are open 24, day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, every day of the year. And 
Um, there's 121 local forecast offices across the country. This kind of gives you an idea of how expansive they are. Um, and we also have national centers. I already mentioned the Climate Prediction Center, um, probably some of our most famous national centers, National Hurricane Center, uh, as well as the Storm Prediction Center, which I use kind of a medical um, analogy that the uh, as at the local office level, we're kind of our the general practitioners in that we um, have a very uh, focused loc locus local area, but we deal with every kind of weather that comes to this area. Meanwhile, at the national level, um, those are the specialists. So they have are looking at the whole country, in some cases beyond just the, the bounds of the country, um, but they are focused on a specific type of meteorology. So National Hurricane Center obviously is focused on tropical systems, for example. Um, when uh, So I, I shared with you a, a resource that has a whole bunch of, uh, I'm sorry, I shared with you a, a link that has a whole bunch of resources hyperlinked, but I want to emphasize a little bit, we talked about, you know, talking about, you know, we have alerts up now for um, coastal flooding for, for tonight, and what exactly does that all mean? I always like to emphasize what is the difference between a watch and a warning, because um, there is quite a bit of uncertainty. So to start off, on this timeline, it goes from left to right, being left being the furthest out uh, from a potential hazardous weather event to right being uh, at the right hand side of this uh, image being that it's already happening or it is imminent. Um, and so you start off, oh, we have uh, various outlooks, both in individualized outlooks as well as a one stop shop called a hazardous weather outlook. Um, and that is going to be potentially where you have the most lead time to any potential hazardous weather event. Um, but it's also not going to have the it's going to have the least amount of detail. And it's probably going to be covering a broader area. Um, and um, then we go into uh, watch. So when we get to be within two to three days of any potential hazardous weather, be it like more of our longer developing weather, like a um, winter weather or flooding, um, we may issue a watch. A little bit different when we're talking about severe thunderstorms and tornadoes, um, because so many things have to come together just right, that a watch for a, a tornado watch or a severe thunderstorm watch is probably only going to be issued like two to six hours before when we get um, storms develop. And then if something is imminent, uh, whatever hazardous weather we are warning for is already occurring or we're seeing very strong evidence that it's about to occur, then that's when we would issue a warning. Tornado warning, blizzard warning, flash flood warning, severe thunderstorm warning, you know, qu quite a lot of different warnings that uh, that we would issue. Um, there's another one on here that I, I hesitate to mention too much because it is eventually gonna be going away, but there's something called an advisory. Um, and that just means hazardous weather that is, um, is occurring and could be hazardous if you don't take proper precautions, um, but is not necessarily completely life-threatening. So the prime example I give is if we have three inches of snow here in South Jersey, snow, you know, you need to take caution. You might need to add some extra time into your commute. Um, there's certainly going to be some travel congestion, but as long as people take it slow and are um, mindful of the potential slippery conditions, it's probably not going to shut down things. Compare that with 10 inches of snow. Now that's a possibility of that's going to really cause some, some major issues, major headaches um, with services around our area. So the three inches of snow, that would be a winter weather advisory. 10 inches of snow, that'd be a winter storm warning. All that being said, we know this is confusing and currently within the National Weather Service, there's a campaign for hazard simplification to try to make things simpler, to make it more easily understandable um, by the general public. So eventually, and this is not even anywhere in the near term future, but eventually this will go away and we'll just have like a plain language statement if there's something that is hazardous but not quite reaching criteria. Um, so as I mentioned, and this is just kind of a visual representation of what I said, outlook furthest out in time, but it's going to be covering a broader area and they're going to have the least amount of detail. So the yellow area in here would represent what is, in this case, we're going to, using a severe thunderstorm as an example, and what is a, um, you know, a severe thunderstorm outlook. 
a watch may cover multiple counties, um, even multiple states. Um, starting to hone in a little bit and a little bit more detail. Uh, and then finally get a warning and that could not even cover an entire county. That could just be a portion of a county. Um, it has the most amount of detail, but will be issued the least for the, the closest to the potential impacts of hazardous weather. Uh, so with that, um, the resources that I have available, uh, like I said, is in the chat. It's also, you can use this QR code um, as well as the link here. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I will definitely be on um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you all have any uh, questions about the weather in general, um, we certainly have had enough um, enough interesting uh, weather uh, over the last last uh, several days, especially. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So thank you all. Sarah, thank you. That was great. I feel I've learned a new language. This is terrific. Uh, all of the links that Sarah, uh, or, or the programs that Sarah has mentioned, and uh, all of the resources, they're available in the chat. And again, this will all be available on YouTube. Um, I'm now going to hand things over to our friend Lauren Skoronsky from Sustainable Jersey. Lauren, are you there? I am. All right. Thanks so much, Biggie. This has been an incredibly informative program so far. So thank you to all of our speakers. Um, before we jump into the next segment, I just wanted to take a few moments to share a few updates from Sustainable Jersey that might be of interest to you all, but I won't take long because I know you're all eager to hear our next speaker. Um, just also wanted to take a moment to reflect on the movement and everything that you all have been a part of with these stats are incredibly impressive. They're also a little out of date. We don't have, you know, the, the um, addition of money that's gone out this year, new certifications for both the schools and the municipal program. But the number that impresses me the most continually is the 91% of New Jersey's population lives in a registered or certified community in sustainable Jersey. So that's pretty impressive. Um, so you know, if you're a schools person or you um, live in a town with a school, <laughs> you can help help them apply for grants or just know about the fact that we just announced another NJEA round of funding. That's $10,000 and $2,000 grants. And so you can see some of the dates here, the deadlines, and I'll throw everything in the chat links as well. Um, also uh, announcement for the schools, we've got the Empowered Schools Program. So um, if you are in a South Jersey gas or PSEG territory, you can get your schools to sign up um, so that their students are involved and can win prizes for um, using school buildings and their homes as sort of learning labs uh, for real solving real world problems and ultimately creating change through energy efficiency measures. So you can also, schools can also earn points through this program. So it's a really cool thing to have your school sign up for. Um, we are announcing a second round for our PSEG partnership program. Um, basically it offers impactful energy efficiency outreach campaigns for residential, commercial, and also municipal facilities. So there's three tracks you can choose from. Um, and, and basically you get assigned a sustainable Jersey staffer who helps you access these available incentives. Um, you get an outreach toolkit, there's startup grants of $2,500 and, you know, an additional money if you go for the residential or commercial outreach tracks. Um, we had Moorestown, Palmyra, Pal Palmyra, Audubon, Barrington, and Haddonfield, they all participated in the first round, so you could always reach out to someone there to see how it went. Um, but basically, we're here to help you uh, become a more energy efficient community. And uh, lastly, just, um, you know, we've got our, our certification award ceremonies for both the schools on October 24th and on November 14th for the municipalities. Um, where we celebrate all of the amazing work in the certification program and all of the schools and, and municipalities that have come in this year for certification. So um, if you haven't signed up to come, we hope to see you there. Um, and, you know, it, it really, we, we like to highlight, you know, the great work that green teams across New Jersey are doing and Jersey City is no exception. 
um, before I turn it over to our next speaker, I want to give him some props. Um, Jersey City is one of the only towns or cities in the state to have a resiliency element in the master plan, which is all going to be required now moving forward from the DEP. But it's no um, surprise to us that they were innovating. This prior helps the city prioritize areas for infrastructure improvements that will help the city during significant storm events. Um, they completed an energy audit of 26 buildings, which has identified measures to implement and save approximately a quarter of a million dollars each year, like each year, not in total. Um, with 12 EVs in their muni municipal fleet already, maybe even more since I got this stat, uh, Mayor Fulop in 2020 has committed that 100% of the new municipal fleet vehicles will be fully electric by 2030. Several new municipal construction projects have received the Silver LEED certification. The city has a focus on density and affordable housing requirements around transit hubs across the city. They just received $2 million from the New Jersey Urban uh, Community Forestry Program for tree planting to reduce heat island effect across the city and provide workforce development opportunities. And their public schools are rocking and rolling this year. Every single school in the Jersey City public school system is coming in with bronze this year and a digital school star. They're also receiving the Sustainability Makes Sense Award, which recognizes a district that has demonstrated exemplary progress in sustainability through cost savings to the school district through energy uh, savings measures. So it's tough for a large city to do all of this without the support of the administration. And so it's my pleasure to welcome um, Jersey City Mayor, Stephen Fulop. He started his career on Wall Street, but 9-11 drew him to a higher calling. After a tour in the Marines, he decided to stay in public service. He's the youngest mayor in Jersey City history and he's running for governor in 2025. Okay. Mayor Fulop, I would love to uh, turn it over to you now. Okay. First of all, I, I appreciate that, Lauren. And um, let, me, let me just take a second to say thank you to the other speakers, uh, really informative. And thank you for all of you for attending, um, you know, taking time out of your day to talk about an issue that's really important to me. And I think my track record speaks to that. Um, you know, I, I could talk specifically about what we did in Jersey City, which I, I do want to do, and uh, importantly, how we're approaching the campaign for governor and why uh, sustainability and the environment is going to be a key part of what we're trying to do and communicate, and it's going to be intertwined with everything that we do on the campaign. You know, I think that as a starting point, you know, my candidacy is going to be different than any of the other potential candidates just because I have real life learned experience from being an executive in a city like Jersey City that is complicated, that is diverse. So platitudes of just saying that I am going to care about the environment doesn't work for people like me, because as a mayor, you have to actually deliver results and actually have hands on experience as a result of that. Um, I started the campaign in April, and at the time, a lot of people said that, you know, we were starting early and how would be and what was the reason for it and how would we stay relevant? Um, and, and I think we've proven a couple things in those five months. The first is that, um, you know, we certainly have stayed relevant with many mayors jumping on board as early supporters. Um, we've raised a lot of money, which speaks to viability. Um, the mayors jumping on board early in large numbers is significant because people are saying two years out. It doesn't matter what the field looks like. I know that Jersey City's accomplishments and track record speaks volumes, and I'm willing to be a part of that. And mayors, to me, are the most important level of government because they're directly in contact with residents and have the chance to work on things like we're about to discuss. If you go to an elementary school, they know who the president of the United States is, and they know who their respective mayor is. It doesn't matter where you are because it's a very, very personal sort of vote. So when I started the campaign, the reason I started so early was because I wanted to build a campaign that was substantive on policy and viable no matter what the traditional political establishment in New Jersey decided. Historically, you have a couple of people get in a room and decide who's going to be this and who's going to be that. And as I ran for Jersey City against the political machine over here in one, we started early and we ran a substantive policy oriented campaign. And that takes a lot of time. So every month, 
the campaign is committed to rolling out a policy initiative that is detailed, comprehensive, not platitudes, robust and attainable. We started last month with transportation. I mean, if you go to our website, most candidates would probably say, I'm going to lean into the transportation issue and fix transportation. And that's the broad sweeping sort of statement. Our transportation policy is 15 pages long, and not everybody's going to read 15 pages, but you'll see that it is thoughtful, detailed, attainable, as I said. And we're thinking about transportation in a different way of how it impacts every part of life in New Jersey, and particularly the climate conversation that we're about to have. We're going to roll out today our housing policy, and we've also encompassed the environment and sustainability into that plan as well. How do you do tiebreakers for tax credits? How does the how does the state decide the Aspire program? Today, the environmental and sustainable components of development are not included in that. The climbing thread is going to be consistent in every component of what we're doing. And I think my track record as mayor speaks to that. She touched on a little bit, but yes, we've done detailed climate plans, resiliency plans. We've carefully executed that. We've gradually started to compete. Uh, transition our entire fleet over to electric. We were the first in the northeast of the country to have um, to have a uh, electric garbage trucks. Uh, we commit to, uh, we set a goal. Sometimes we exceed it, sometimes we don't, but generally we, we commit to doing about 350 new trees per year. We've been a leader with regards to creating infrastructure in Jersey City for public use around electrif electrification of vehicles. So we have charging stations almost in every part of the city at this point. So we've been really committed to that. And we've been leading by example with transitioning, uh, with moving towards more green infrastructure and encouraging more use of microtransit systems. We have the largest microtransit system in the entire country that we partnered with Via on to encourage less car usage. We've created a massive bike share program, the largest in New Jersey with protected bike lanes throughout the city. And, uh, you know, we're committed to this more in just words, but in our action. And so our track record has been really good. It's kind of the broad reason for our campaign started so early. And I just look forward to kind of a conversation and questions and really a conversation about how I can encompass more ideas that some of you may have into our policy platform when we roll out the sustainability initiatives in early 2024. Said a lot there, I think, quickly. But if there's any questions or comments, we can take the conversation wherever you want it to go. Thank you so much, Mayor. That was great and and true to their public service form. You are right on time. So I um I believe we are going to hold questions until all of our speakers are done. We have one more okay. right after you, if you don't mind, you know, hanging around and. and the next speaker is going to be really, really great. So um, thanks so much. All the links have been posted in the um, in the chat um, and it's now time for the strong finish. So I'm gonna bring Isla on to introduce our final guest. Hi, Isla. Hey. Hi, Lauren. Loving those stats from Sustainable Jersey. Thank you. So we're gonna tie all of this together tonight, climate, weather, and lowering emissions from transportation. Um, all of that together, underscoring that is our right to clean a clean and healthy environment. You've all read about the huge win recently in the youth-led climate trial in Montana. And if you were here a few minutes early, um, before we got started, there were a couple clips on that, video clips about that. Well, here to tell us about it and what it means for the Green Amendment in New Jersey, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to welcome the founder of Green Amendments for the Generations, um, Delaware River uh, Waterkeeper and a hero to all of us, Maya Van Rossum. Hi, Maya. Hi, so glad to be here. Um, so I have a little bit of a different um, approach because I guess I got the message differently about what you wanted me to talk about, but that's okay. We'll wrap it all up together. And I think where the mayor ended is a great place to start because he's looking for new ideas that he can add to his platform and, and help you know carry the message on. And the Green Amendment here in the state of New Jersey is a great one for you to advance um, in your leadership role in politics. And especially if you do go on to become the governor, the support for a New Jersey Green Amendment would be powerful, important, historic, and a great legacy. So how's that for my start? 
<laughs> so I am um, Maya Van Rossum. I I've had the honor of the last 30 years of serving as the Delaware Riverkeeper and leader of the four state organization, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. But as a result of that work, I've also founded the National Green Amendments for the Generations Movement, which is all about the topic I'm going to talk about tonight. But I got a, um, only 10 minutes and I'm going to try to keep it short because I know that um, that it, time is getting on. So um, really quickly, right, we've been focusing a lot tonight on the climate crisis, but of course, across New Jersey, people are facing a lot of environmental issues, right? They're, they're, they're concerned about contaminated water and contaminated air, you know, about the rising floodwaters, whether it's due to the climate crisis or the way we're developing our landscapes, expanding indus industries, their impacts on the environment, but also the quality of people's lives and much, much more. And so people really are struggling for what is that thing that I need to do to really make a difference in taking on the climate crisis, environmental justice issues, or environmental protection writ large? And the answer is we need to do everything. There is no one thing that we need to do, right? We need to continue our advocacy and our litigation and passing good legislation and enforcing that legislation and testifying and protesting and voting and all of that good stuff. But something that we also really, really need to do here in the state of New Jersey and in states across our nation is we need to transform our system of law and governance when it comes to the environment, environmental protection, environmental justice, and taking on the climate crisis. And transforming our system of laws and governance when it comes to the environment does not mean passing just one more law. The fact of the matter is we have hundreds of thousands of laws in the state of New Jersey. We've got laws and regulations and policies and programs and agencies that are all supposed to be dedicated to the environment and environmental protection. And yet we are still facing devastating harms when it comes to environmental protection and environmental justice. New Jersey is certainly doing its part, not just to you know, advance good clean energy, but also to exacerbate the climate crisis. There are plenty of bad things that are happening like liquefied natural gas export facility proposals, for example. Um, so, and, and, and the truth is, you know, even if we pass one more law and it's a really, really great law, it's not going to be able to address all of the problems that we face. They're just too vast and we can't anticipate everything. The other thing we have to recognize when we think about our system of, of laws and governance here in New Jersey and how our environmental protection laws actually work. Not only can there be no one law that will cover every circumstance, every scenario, every issue. Um, but the truth is that the way our laws are written here in New Jersey, the way they're written across the nation when it comes to the environment, is they're really focused on legalizing environmental pollution, degradation, and harm. You get the right reviews, the right permits, the right approvals from the right agency. You can inflict quite a bit of harm on our environment here in the state of New Jersey, especially when you put your industrial operation next to the 10 others that are already overwhelming some community or exacerbating some other harms. Our system of laws and governance here in New Jersey and nationwide, this is not just about New Jersey, this is every state across our nation. This is our federal environmental laws, all of our laws, um, are focused on legalizing pollution, not preventing harm before it starts. There's sort of this, this, this assumption that pollution and degradation and harm is a foregone conclusion, rather than starting from the, the, the assumption and the question, do we actually need to allow it to happen in the first place? And often the answer, frankly, is no. And yet our laws don't, don't lead us to that conclusion. Um, our system of laws also have a lot of gaps. And there are a lot of loopholes. There are a lot of industries intentionally written out of the laws. There are a lot of things that aren't regulated at all, right? A lot of people have been hearing about forever chemicals. At the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, we've been working on this issue, leading the way in the state of New Jersey for over a decade. We have forever chemicals proliferating, right? PFAS contaminants, PFAS, PFOA, PFNA, proliferating this toxic man-made family of chemicals, proliferating into our environment, in drinking water supplies, into the bodies of the people of New Jersey because of an absence, an absence 
of legislation or regulation to prevent this man-made of family chemicals from being manufactured and utilized in ways that is now inflicting such devastating consequences. It's only in recent years through a lot of hard work by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and others that we actually have now New Jersey at the forefront of PFAS, PFOA, forever chemical regulations. But it's that absence, that gap in the law that allowed us to so many people to suffer so many harm already right now today. And we're not going to really be able to roll back the clock, to be honest. Um, so when it comes to environmental protection in New Jersey, when it comes to taking on the cr climate crisis and environmental justice, we really need transformational change. We need to change this system of laws and governance so it truly is focused on prevention of harm and protection of people. And green amendments and a New Jersey green amendment specifically here in the state of New Jersey are that change. What a green amendment is, it is, it is a constitutional amendment that is added to the Bill of Rights section of our state constitutions, which recognize and protects the rights of all people to a clean, safe, and healthy environment including a safe climate and lifting up those rights so they are given the same highest constitutional standing recognition and protection as the other fundamental rights we hold dear, like the right to free speech, like the right to freedom of religion. Now, if you want to get this highest constitutional protection for our environmental rights, like we give to those other fundamental rights, there are essential criteria, what I call the Green Amendment criteria, that have to be met. I'm not gonna go through those criteria tonight, that's another talk. Um, but we have to fulfill these key criteria in order to have language that's gonna make a meaningful difference in terms of our constitution. But when we do, when we pass constitutional language, we add it to the Bill of Rights section of our constitution that clearly recognizes and protects our environmental rights, we empower our laws, when it comes to environmental protection and we empower our people as they seek to advocate for protection of the environment. Legally, we literally do raise up our rights to clean water and clean air, a safe climate and healthy environments. So they are given highest constitutional standing, recognition and, pro and protection and enforceability by the people in the same way we give this highest constitutional protection to those other fundamental rights we hold dear. We all know how powerfully the rights to free speech and freedom of religion are protected. Well, now we give that same power to the environment. With a, with a constitutional green amendment in place, all government officials at every level of government will become constitutionally bound. I mean, the local town council to the state legislature, to the governor's office, all the regulatory agencies in between, all government officials become constitutionally bound to protect the environmental rights of all the people of the state, and they must protect those rights equitably. No more environmental sacrifice zones. If you have an environmental sacrifice zone where a community of color, an indigenous community, or a low-income community is being disproportionately impacted by highly polluting industrial operations, well, you may have a constitutional question that needs to be addressed. With a constitutional green amendment added to the New Jersey um, state constitution, we will reorient government action and decision-making so it is focused on prevention of harm first, not just jumping to the end of the process and saying, oops, it's gonna happen, so what permits will we issue to allow it? And with the right language, we can secure meaningful generational protection. We can truly protect the environmental rights of future generations. We can protect natural resources for future generations. We can help ensure that our future generations do have a safe climate in which they can enjoy their lives. And having an obligation to protect the environmental rights of future generations is not just aspirational when you have it in a constitutional Green Amendment. It is meaningful, it is legal, and it is enforceable. And we've proven that in the state of Pennsylvania where we had this kind of language. When we have a Green Amendment added to the New Jersey State Constitution, all of the laws that are already on the books are gonna be strengthened because now it's not just gonna be up to the agencies how clean is clean when it comes to clean water or clean air. They're gonna to have to be interpreting and applying that language in service to their constitutional duty to protect the environmental rights of the people, knowing that if they don't define it properly or fairly or equitably, that the people, the people have the ultimate power to challenge their bad decision or action in court. 
When there's a gap in the law, when there's a deficiency, when there's a loophole, a law doesn't provide people the protections they need, the people are going to be able to turn to their constitutional right to clean water and clean air to try to get a remedy. When our government officials get it wrong, people will get access to the courts to challenge bad government decision making. And it's not just about strengthening the law, it's about strengthening advocates, advocacy and activists fighting for the environment because now when they're fighting for the people and the earth that they love, they're also going to be fighting for a constitutional entitlement. So it will change the, their own rights, um, the, the, their own sense of strength as they advocate for the environment. But they're also gonna know that everybody on the decision-making dais to whom they're speaking is actually gonna have to listen to them now, can't be dismissive of their advocacy for the environment because now all of those government officials to whom they are advocating have a constitutional obligation to protect the environmental rights of the people and the natural resources of the state. This is a nationwide movement that starts with state leadership. We're going state by state by state to get the passage of constitutional green amendments and ultimately we'll seek to get one in the federal constitution. Right now, there are three states with green amendments, Pennsylvania, Montana, and New York, but more and more states are coming on board seek, seeking this powerful protection as well. New Jersey was at the head of the pack. The New Jersey Green Amendment proposal was put forth November 30th of 2017. But because of, frankly, I consider it an abuse of political power and the failure by those in leadership in New Jersey government, by their decision refusing to schedule hearings for the Green Amendment, it has not progressed in all the time that it's been proposed. New York, who proposed a Green Amendment after New Jersey, already has their Green Amendment in place, and it's making a powerful difference for the people who are utilizing it to secure otherwise unachievable protections. This is the language that's been put forth for New Jersey, that every person has a right to a clean and healthy environment, including pure water, clean air, ecologically healthy habitats, that the state has an obligation to protect the natural resources of the state for both present and future generations, that it must serve as trustee in protecting the state's natural resources for the benefit of all the people, which means not for industry pop profits or their own political agendas, it means for the people. Um, and then there's other powerful language that's critically important and why if this amendment was added to the New Jersey state constitution, it would bring transformational change to environmental protection in the state. Right now, more than half the um, entire New Jersey legislature are signed on as co-sponsors of the amendment, but yet a limited few are refusing to put the amendment up for a hearing at the committee level. No hearing, no vote, no vote, no progress. And the people have been stripped of their voice here in the state of New Jersey. Does it really make a difference? Yes. So, you know, we we heard about the 16 youth that were able to challenge a Montana state law that prohibited, prohibited government officials from considering the climate crisis in their decision-making um, in the state. And as a result, we're able to quite easily continue to perpetuate and grow dirty fossil fuel extraction, transportation, um, processing and utilization with devastating consequences. But because Montana has a green amendment, protecting the environmental rights of the people, these 16 youth were able to grab onto their constitutional entitlement to a clean and healthful environment to get that law overturned. Now, Montana government officials not just can consider the climate crisis in their decision-making, but they actually have to. This is the first time that we've had a victory where climate was sort of the core argument with a Green Amendment, but it's not the first Green Amendment or the first victory where Green Amendments have made a difference. In the state of Pennsylvania, we defeated a devastatingly pro-fracking law that had been put forth by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Over a decade ago, we overturned this law as being unconstitutional. In Montana, as well as in Pennsylvania, but specifically in Montana, we there have been industrial gold mining operation permits that would have allowed industrial gold mining operations in sensitive ecosystems with serious impacts for the environment, for ecotourism and for communities. These permits have been voided because they were violating the constitutional entitlements of the people. And those permits, they were voided and they were never reissued. And I suspect that's because they couldn't do it in a way that would also protect environmental rights. 
In Pennsylvania, we've used the Green Amendment to secure cleanup of a long ignored toxic site. And in the state of New York, they're already using their their Green Amendment, which is less than two years old, in a lot of powerful ways, including to address um, hazardous air emissions um, and greenhouse gas emissions coming off of a rapidly expanding landfill that the state, where the state is just ignoring the, the, the pleas of the community to have their clean air protected. And it's not just people and organizations that are grabbing hold of the Green Amendment to secure critical environmental protections. Municipal officials in the state in, in Marple Township outside of Philadelphia use their Green Amendment to protect their last piece of natural green space from a devastating development operation. And both Pennsylvania and Montana government officials have used their Green Amendments in different ways to provide critical protections to drinking water supplies. So this is the powerful movement sweeping the nation. New Jersey could be at the forefront if it chose to. The website is forthegenerations.org for the national movement, njgreenamendment.org um, if you want to see what's happening in New Jersey. There's a Green Amendment Action app. You can find that on the website. And of course, there's a, the book, The Green Amendment, The People's Fight for a Clean, Safe, and Healthy Environment. And I write about the state of New Jersey a lot in the book. So if you're interested, every penny of profit goes to the Green Amendment movement and will help us get a Green Amendment here in the state of New Jersey. So I hope the mayor um, and gubernatorial candidate was listening and that you are going to add the Green Amendment to your agenda for the future. That was great. That was really, really terrific. I think I'm looking forward to following up and I don't see any reason why I wouldn't. I was actually signing off saying that I actually have a conflict. I got to jump off the call in five minutes, but um, I... I do look forward to working with all of you, and there was no reason why I wouldn't uh, be pushing this. But yes, okay, Vicky, we got a couple of questions. But yes, if you could email me some of that information, that would be terrific. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you so so much, Maya. Um, and as she said, we the people in New Jersey can act now for the the Green Amendment, um, and, you know, contact your New Jersey legislators if you want. Another thing you could do um, is have your local town consider adopting a resolution in support of the Green Amendment. Okay, Vicki, go ahead. Thanks, Zyla. And Maya, that was fabulous. Thank you. I am so energized. <laughs> but uh, there are other people who are energized. And before Mayor Fuller leaves us, we wanted to catch him for one or two, well, at least one question. And um, I think it is uh, Bill Sirocco who uh, has been waiting to ask a question. It was a lengthy one. I'll ask you to state it yourself, please. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. And thank, thanks to Mayor Fulop for, for coming on and giving us time. I, was, I used to live in Jersey City on Steuben Street in a walk-up building that I think was knocked down and uh, no longer exists, but really impressed with what you've done in Jersey City. I think it's like a model for the rest of the state. I'm curious about your views, since this is a uh, environmental focus meeting, on the use of trash incinerators for waste disposal in New Jersey. Um, just in general, what you think about that as a tool for getting rid of waste in, in New Jersey. And number two, whether you support the use of uh, renewable energy credits uh, for uh, trash incinerators in the state of New Jersey and what plans, if any, you would have to change policy in, in that in that way. Thank you. Yeah. So 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 uh, I'm not going to spouse that I'm an expert on the incinerator process today. Obviously, I would look for alternative options around that. And I think my track record in Jersey City is, you know, that I'm not reluctant to lean into controversial issues or difficult to achieve issues. What I would tell you is that um, on the tax credit side, I generally am very, very supportive of changing people's habits with aggressive use of incentives. I find that people respond better and a lot of our policies are tailored around that. And then finally, I would say, you know, when, when you talk about kind of urban issues around sustainability, things that I directly deal with and know, um, I could speak to uh, quite detailed. When you're talking broadly around more of the statewide policy, some of the things I'm still learning, I'll be the first to say. And so like part of the conversation today was, hey, this is who I am. I have a good track record on this on the city side over here, looking to learn more with groups like all of you that I 
greatly respect and, and saying, hey, I don't know everything. But when we do lean into that sustainability platform, what I can tell you is it will be very comprehensive and it's going to lean into the climate crisis in an aggressive way. So like I take notes here, I can't tell you I know everything about incinerators today. So I'd be more interested in learning. But broadly speaking, the tax credit conversation is something I'm supportive of. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, I don't see any more questions for you in the chat. Uh, I would like to invite all of our uh, attendees to actually, uh, if you can just let us know you have a question, we can call on you so you can type it out. That helps us uh, direct your questions as well. Um, and I don't see any more for, for you, Mayor Fuld, before we let you go. Thank you so very much. Um, I'll go on and ask uh, Marty Levin, who has a question for Maya. If you'll state your question, please. As soon as I get myself off mute, thanks, Vicki. Uh, wow, what a great evening. So many interesting presentations. And Maya, I so appreciate your energy and your and your commitment to this initiative. I wasn't sure that uh, that, that bill was first uh, introduced in 2017. It's been quite a quite a lengthy uh, process. I did check and see that uh, Carol Murphy and William Moen uh, on the assembly are uh, now uh, signed on to support the bill. And on the uh, on the uh, Senate side, Gene Stanfield from Burlington County is also on on that side. But there are other people and I, I mentioned in my in my little message, uh, we had both Senator Singleton and Senator Smith here last year talking about their concerns about the Green Amendment. And one of the things Senator Smith indicated was that he didn't think there were many examples to show how the Green Amendment could be you know, really effective. Well, of course, now we've got that case in Montana. So I think it's time to go back and and have another conversation with Senator Smith and I think Senator Singleton will uh, be um, uh, also uh, influenced by uh, by by the the recent work. And also, I I read your nine page document on the uh, on the New Jersey Green Amendment website, which I think is terrific, and it really answers so many of the questions. So I guess my question to you is, what can we do as individuals and as 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 uh, you know activists in our own communities to get this? get this thing moving so that we can get it on the on the bill maybe before mayor Fulop becomes the governor even yeah and so um thank you so much marty for that and always for your great activism for the environment i so appreciate you and i want to mention isla and rachel who are on this somewhere out there right they're key leaders in our new jersey green amendment movement i really appreciate them and so is june i see june all the time <laughs> So I want really lots of key leaders that are a part of this. Um, I do just want to be frank. Don't let Senator Smith hoodwink you. Um, Senator Smith has been a moving target on what his concerns are about the Green Amendment. And the examples that, like I said, the, 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 the Montana case is only the most recent. There are so many examples of how green amendments in Pennsylvania, Montana, and New York have made a powerful difference in an array of issues. And Senator Smith is well aware of them because I have told him about them all, or I have sent him writings about them in response to direct email questions. And so it's really, I think, so disingenuous and unfair for him to say, oh, I don't think they make a difference. He does know they make a difference. And I think that that's really part of the problem. And the last concern when, frankly, I ended up debating him a little bit in the public about the Green Amendment, what his concern then was, was he was concerned that there would be unintended consequences. Unintended consequences. That was his concern. Well, that is malarkey. Okay, yes, there might be unintended consequences. We might actually help save the planet. That would be a great unintended consequence. So I do just want to do just want to say that. But what people really can do is if you go on to njgreenamendments.org, you go to the take action page and the resources page. First off, check to see if you're a representative and you mentioned so many, Marty, are they already a co-sponsor? If not, urge them to become a co-sponsor. If they're a co-sponsor already, urge them to demand a hearing right away as soon as possible on the Green Amendment, because we can make this happen. We can bring this to the fore in just two short years if our legislators 
will give the people a chance to be heard and they will actually vote on this rather than relegating it to the heat pile of heat piles of silence. Um, letters to the editor to demand to demand that legislators speak up and speak out on this. Town resolutions, you know, is another thing that people can do. But really, when it comes down to it, we need our legislators, we need leaders like Senator Smith to get out of the way and give the people a chance to be heard. And so we try to put all of that information on the take action page of njgreenamendment.org. That's really what we need. We just need a chance for the people to be heard and for our legislators to vote. Thanks, Maya. That's great. Appreciate it. Thanks, Renee. I'm with you. <laughs> I won't read it on the video, but. Deronda, do you have a question for James? I have a question for Dr. Shop. I wasn't sure if that part came up yet. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Okay, so I thank you for your, I thank everyone, all the presenters for that great information. But I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Shop, with all the adverse impact against uh, communities of color and the lower income communities, because it's not all the same, uh, would you say that there should be some sort of discount or, you know, medical insurance or medical coverage that should be given to these uh, communities in light of the fact that we are disproportionately impacted, regardless of whether we are rich or poor, uh, race is, is the determinant factor here. Uh, should there be any accommodations for medical coverage in your opinion? So I'll say first, based on my position as a scientist at Rutgers, I can't necessarily give policy recommendations on this case as a scientist. Um, but the fact of the matter is our communities of color are very disproportionately impacted by climate change and will continue to do so. So thinking about and like thinking about discounts for various health insurance, thinking about other sorts of interventions to help um, <clears throat> help our communities of color in New Jersey just prepare for, deal with, hopefully avoid um, the effects of climate change as best we can, that seems like a good idea to me. Um, yeah, I'm more on the science end and less on like the policy and implementation end on that. That seems fair. We didn't <laughs> ask you to talk about science, but wow, that's a, a just a fabulous question. And, you know, it's the question that follows everything you're teaching us about the impacts of climate on on uh, urban heat islands and everything else where there are always disproportionate effects. Uh, so I just us. wanted to say, yeah. it, I don't know how much communities of color could avoid climate change <laughs> or the effects of climate change, uh, but I mean, I, I would think that it would mean that we need more education on climate change and to be a little more diligent personally as people of color and people in lower income communities. And um, you'd have to take matters into our own hands, I would say. I mean, I am, but that's not the prevailing behavior. So I, I take that as a, 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 an opportunity for us to, you know, create more education and more awareness. And I will follow that up. That is um, a very key portion of it, just for all of our communities, but certainly making sure that everyone has the information they need to adequately respond to any sort of climate change effects and especially the negative health outcomes. So some of the work I'm doing right now is looking at the urban heat island um, in Camden and the like, and our goal is to provide actionable information for, for folks in Camden, for example. Similarly, I have research with um, in agriculture for climate change effects. Again, with the idea that um, the research that I do at Rutgers and really the mission of a lot of folks at Rutgers is to provide information for our communities that is actionable so that when it comes to climate change, they're able to actually respond in a meaningful and proactive way. Now, getting that information out there, working on that, but I'm trying my best. James, I can think of a couple of people who are on this call, Sharonda and Bill, Renee, a few others who are very active in that area, and I think will be 
uh, very happy to follow up with you when when you're ready to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that charge. <laughs> and thank you, Sharonda. Okay, we have a question now, and this one is for Sarah from Brittany Byer. Brittany, would you like to state your question or would you like me to read it? Sure, thanks, Vicki. Um, so first off, kudos to all the speakers. This has been excellent. Um, so my question is for Sarah, um, and it comes from my fellow teammates on the Barrington Green team. Uh, could you please share how the National Weather Service plans to inform the public about how to receive the weather alerts um, and also understand how the increases and rainfall and intensity relate to climate change? Um, so um, as far as how to receive weather alerts, um, there's, you know, we have a whole presentation. I didn't get into it with this presentation, but uh, we have a whole presentation on how people can receive weather alerts. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, methods. There's weather radio that's been around since the, you know, for decades now. Um, and there's all sorts of third-party Apple apps, websites. And you know, we, when we, uh, we just, when we message this, we just encourage people to make sure that they're relying on a trusted weather source uh, because there's a lot of people now out with, um, you know, a, social, a voice on social media. Um, but, you know, commercial TV, commercial radio, um, a lot of different ways to receive uh, weather weather alerts and weather watches and warnings. One of the big initiatives over the last 15 years is uh, wireless emergency alerts. Uh, that's not specifically with the National Weather Service. In fact, that's a uh, program that was developed in conjunction between the um, FCC, uh, FEMA, as well as um, all of the cellular carriers. So any of you all with a, you know, with a smartphone, um, you've pro you're probably familiar with when I say wireless emergency alerts. If I say it's that really loud sound that sometimes come ac comes across your your phone, it may be a weather alert. It may be a amber alert. Could be a civil emergency message. Uh, that was a huge step. Uh, it was. It's now 11 years old. Uh, celebrated its 10 years last year, um, and uh, that was a huge step in making sure people are aware of the most urgent uh, needs. Um, we have been trying to refine it through the years. Uh, so not everything that we issue goes across on the wireless emergency alerts because some of the feedback we've received. We want to make sure that we're warning people about the most severe stuff, but not to the point that they're disabling their wireless emergency alerts or disabling whatever method that they're looking at. Um, so as a result, specifically talking about the um, extreme precipitation, not all of the flash flood warnings will go across wireless emergency alerts anymore. It used to be that way up until 2019, um, but there, there are just so many flash flood warnings that we have to issue uh, that people were starting to ignore them. So now only like the most severe of flash flood warnings are going across. So that's one way. As far as the communication method, that's something that, that those are some of the initiatives we have and we continue to look at. Um, as far as communicating, um, you know, the um the extreme precipitation events um with that we do have a big uh public safety um component mission um not just issuing the alerts but also getting out and doing presentations on weather safety one of the programs that we have is called skywarn spotters um and that is uh something that we do um at least a few times a year we'll do a presentation uh, either a live webinar and also try to do a few in-person sessions that just talk about the um, hazardous weather that we can encounter in this area and what are the protective actions you need to take um, against flash flooding, for example, as one of the big topics that we have. Because unfortunately, in the U.S., when you're looking at severe weather um, fatalities, um, we have on average more fatalities due to flash flooding and flooding than due to tornadoes or hurricanes or thunderstorms. The only thing that surpasses that in weather-related fatalities in the U.S. Uh, is extreme heat. Um, so we we do a lot of emphasis on that when we're doing weather safety talks. Um, another thing is we work very closely with emergency management in helping them develop 
um, tabletop exercises or ex or considering what is a worst case scenario in terms of you know flooding amounts or considering what is the worst case scenario in terms of um, winter weather and impactful winter weather. Um, so we work very closely with all the um, 33 counties that we work with uh, that we cover as well as the, the states that we cover um, with their emergency management agencies as well. Well, thank you, Sarah, for that very thorough answer. And thanks, Brittany, for the question. We have time for just one more question. And I understand Scott Billy has a question for Maya. Scott, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Maya, hi. I was wondering, um, as far as getting more organizations involved in signing up to, to support the effort, as opposed to individuals, have you um, had good success with um, with that? Or like how... How would you suggest people get their church group or maybe the green teams and towns to sign on board? Um, what 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 can that uh, do to help your cause? So it's good to see you again, Scott. Thank you very much for always being so supportive. Um, the, the 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 truth is anything and everything helps. At this point, we really need to spread the word in forums like this and do exactly what you're saying, right? Urge people to sign up. And then when we have calls to action to take action, things were a little bit quiet over the summer while the legislature was out and we were trying to regroup. But you know, if people do have a faith group or a green team and they would like, like me to come speak and talk about what the Green Amendment is and answer their questions, um, happy to do that. Just get in touch. You know, I'll put my email in the in the chat. Um, people, when they sign up and things are really moving, we put calls to action out directly to people to urge them to get engaged. I think we're probably going to anticipate doing some trainings again soon so that when we get to the, probably after the election, we're going to really be encouraging people to press hard for this idea of a hearing before the end of the legislative session. And so we're gonna want people informed, knowing what they're talking about, feeling comfortable talking about the Green Amendment, and then willing to join us, whether it's by phone or on email or in letter or in person to really urge their legislators um, to, to do this call for a hearing. I mean, that is really the stumbling block. Um, and so, but I think you really hit the nail on the head, Scott. It really is about people getting informed and engaged. And the best way to do that is really to, to reach out. And as I said, help us spread the word. And then when you're signed up and signed in, we can we can help people let, let people know what's going on. Great, thanks. How was your birthday? <laughs> yeah. I spent thanks with a great group of people. I have to stop there as we're at the end of our scheduled time. Uh, thanks so much to all our guests. It was really informative. I, I really enjoyed our discussion tonight. Uh, don't forget to join the TCS Discord. The meeting recording will be on the TCS YouTube channel tomorrow. Uh, don't hesitate, hesitate to contact us via info at tcs at hub.org on Discord or via social media. Uh, good night, everyone. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you. It was great. Good night, all. This was terrific. Thank you. Thank you for having me.